3 by the University of Cambridge Local Examination Syndicate Published by Cambridge University Press This recording is copyright Test 4 You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work all the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. Write all your answers in the listening question booklet. At the end of the test, you will be given ten minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section one. Section one. You will hear a conversation between two friends who are planning to visit a friend of theirs who has just had a baby. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. You will see that there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. John, I've just had some good news. Susan has had her baby. Do you know when she had it? Yesterday, the 10th of August. Oh, my father was born on August the 10th. The baby was born on the 10th of August. So, the 10th of August has been written on the form. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 1 to 5. John, I've just had some good news. Susan has had her baby. Do you know when she had it? Yesterday, the 10th of August. Oh, my father was born on August the 10th. Give me the details and I'll make a note for everyone at work. OK. Well, was it a boy or a girl? It's a boy. And what are they going to call him? Tom. Tom Lightfoot. That sounds quite good, don't you think? Yes. That has quite a good ring to it. You know, he's quite a big baby. He weighed four and a quarter kilos when he was born. Oh, that does sound big, four and a quarter kilos. And he's long, too, 46 centimetres. Mmm, tall parents. He'll grow up to be over two metres, I'd say. With masses of black hair, curly black hair. You know, we should go and visit them in hospital. What about tomorrow afternoon at around 1 p.m.? Yeah, it's OK. Where should we meet? Ah, I could come and pick you up at your house if you like. Yes, that would be wonderful. My car is still off the road. Just refresh my memory. Uh, what's the address again? It's 15 Chesterfield Road, Paddington. It's next to the library, isn't it? Uh, not exactly. It's next to a bank. The State Bank, actually. The library is opposite us on the corner. That's right. And there's a garage on the other street corner. I remember now. Mm. So you'll pick me up at a quarter to one and we'll be there at one easily. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Now, what should we take? We must take them something. I always think flowers are good to take to someone in hospital, don't you? Well, not really. Everyone always brings flowers and they don't last. I think it's much better to take a pot plant so she can take it home with her. Yes, but then she has to remember to water it. And what about a big box of chocolates? OK. Chocolates sounds fine. 
We should get something for the baby, too. What do、mm. you think? Yes, you're right. What do you think of something like baby shampoo or talcum powder? Or we could get a little hat or something like that. <laughs> we don't know the size or the right color, do we? I think we should get something they wouldn't normally buy. What about a soft toy of some sort? Yes, a soft toy. What about a teddy bear? I could get one early tomorrow at the market, and I could probably get the chocolates there, too. Good. So you'll pick me up at a quarter to one at my place, and I'll make sure that I've got the presents. You must remember how much you paid for the gifts, so I can pay you back for half. If they're going to be from both of us, I would like to go shares. Okay. I'd say the chocolates would be about $15 for something nice and not too small, and the toy would be around $35 or so, I think. Good. That'll be fine. About $25 each, then. Good. I'll pick you up then on Sunday at 12 45. Okay. See you then. Bye. That is the end of section one. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two. You will hear a popular science radio program. Liz Shearer talks about some new devices for use in the home. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to sixteen. Now listen carefully to the radio program, and answer questions eleven to sixteen. Good evening. Tonight's show comes to you from the Good Home Exhibition in Duke's Court, where we've been trying out some of the latest gadgets on show here, and getting our resident expert Liz Shearer to tell us which ones are worth buying and which will die a death. Well, hello. Yes, John. I've been investigating four new household gadgets and sorting out the advantages and disadvantages, and then really deciding what are must buys, what are maybe buys, and what are never buys. <laughs> Let's start with this vacuum flask for keeping drinks hot. Well, I felt this had quite a lot going for it. Most of all is the fact that it contains no glass. And is therefore unbreakable to all intents and purposes. It's made of stainless steel, which is guaranteed for twenty years. <laughs> Hope that's long enough. <laughs> and it's true what the manufacturer claims that it does maintain heat for eighteen hours. So that's pretty good. On the downside, it really works out to be quite expensive, and much more surprisingly, it unfortunately leaves a strange taste. You know, when you've drunk from it. So all in all. My recommendation would be: it's got plenty of advantages, but it is rather expensive. So I'd say you should maybe buy it. Moving on to a natty little device, the whistle key holder. Basically, this is where you whistle, and the key holder gives off a high-pitched noise and flashes light, so you can find it. One advantage of this model is that it also has a small light. You press the button, and this means you can find keyholes easily. I also felt the small size was a real advantage. Now, on the weaker side, I did find the noise unpleasant, which I'm sure the designers could have done something about. And I found that it didn't work through metal, so it's mainly useful finding in coat pockets, cushions, etc. But taken as a whole, I thought it was a masterpiece of design and would highly recommend it. Now you have some time to look at questions seventeen to twenty.
Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. The third gizmo is called the Army Flashlight because it was developed initially for military use. It works by squeezing the handle to generate the power. Its advantages are that it can be used for outside activities and also, and this is one of the surprising features, it does work underwater. My main objection to it, though, was although it did work in these conditions, this model gave off a weak light. So my recommendation, I'm afraid, would have to be to avoid this one. The decoy camera was last on my list. This is a fake video camera which you fix to your wall to scare off burglars. The advantage of this model is something which makes it look very realistic. It's flashing light. On the downside, it was quite difficult to fix to the wall. However, burglary is such a major problem these days that it is worth the effort. So, this gets my strong recommendation. OK, thanks for that, Liz. And now... I'd like... That is the end of section two. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. Listen to a female student, Amina, talking to her tutor, Dr. Bryson, about her project on local history. Amina has completed a first draft of the project. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully to the first part of the discussion and answer questions 21 to 26. Well, Amina, thanks for letting me have your draft in such good time. Oh, that's all right. I was just um, very anxious to hear what you think of it. You can see that I decided to change the topic. I had been interested in looking at Bering's factory. Oh, I think the hospital was a much better choice. In fact... Well, I have to say that I thought it was good. Oh. There's still lots of work to be done. Oh, yes, of course. But there's plenty of good ideas. It opens well, and the first chapter is fine, but the middle section really stood out for me. Most interesting. That's amazing, because I really didn't find it a bit easy to write. How long did you work on the whole thing? Well, I spent about two or three weeks reading and doing general research, and then I dashed the writing off very quickly. So about four weeks in all. Well, that's about par for the course. You've got a while yet to make the changes. Oh, right. No problem. Right. Let's have a look at my notes here. Okay. Starting with section headings. So the broad divisions are good, but you'll have to redo the actual headings. I've made some suggestions in the margins. Okay, thanks. Now, this information on local housing. I can see why you put it there, but it really isn't relevant to the approach you've taken. I think I see what you mean. Oh, what did I say about the interviews? Oh, I worked very hard on those. I really thought they were valuable. Oh, they are, Amina, but they're very complex and rather unclear at the moment. You're going to have to spend a bit of time making the data a lot clearer. OK, as long as I don't have to remove them altogether. No, don't worry. What about the chronology, the list of dates? I wasn't sure whether I should rewrite those. Hmm. My advice on that is to take them out. I feel... It makes the whole piece appear too simplistic. OK, if it'll help. Now you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30.
Now listen to the rest of the discussion and answer questions 27 to 30. Now, there are a couple of other books I'd like you to look at. Have you got a pen? Right. Approaches to Local History by John Mervis. Right. And then I think you need to think about ways of representing interview data. Have a look at Sight and Sound by Kate Oakwell. Sight and Sound. And you know I'm going away on holiday next week. Yes. So when you've made the changes, I suggest you show the work to your support tutor. Support tutor. Right. Then you do the proofreading. Proofreading? Uh, how, when by, do you think? I uh, aim for the 29th of June. And after that, you should get it laser printed. But be careful, because the computer centre closes on the 10th of July. Mm. And then I hand it in to... Oh, the faculty office, as usual. OK, that's fine. I think I'm all set now. Thanks very much for all your help. A pleasure. See you when I get back. Yep. Thanks, Dr Bryson. Bye. Bye. That is the end of section three. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four. Section four. You will hear a talk given by a university lecturer about the impact of environmental noise on a proposed building site. Before you hear the talk, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 35. Now listen carefully to the first part of the talk and answer questions 31 to 35. Good afternoon. I'm Paula Bundle and I am giving you the lectures on environmental noise this term. Today we're going to look into the effects of noise on a planned housing estate in a particularly difficult part of the new Manchester Park area. This site is not as bad as some I have researched in the past. The Blacktown Airport is closed from 6pm to 7am and this is a great advantage to the site. The only noise after dark is from the highway and the traffic is somewhat reduced between 7.30pm and 5.30am. So the people most affected by the noise will be, I expect, housewives. By the time most of the students and workers have arrived back home in the evening during the week, the noise will have abated to a fairly large extent. The weekends are still a problem, of course, but the traffic is certainly reduced on Saturdays to a large extent, and even more so on Sundays. Of course, modifications to houses will be necessary at a site like this, and they come at a significant cost to the developer and home buyer. The modifications I'm about to outline will add about $25,000 to the price of a newly built house. That will still mean a cheaper house than in a less noisy and more desirable area. A bit of background would not go astray. I understand that you are all familiar with the proposed development site at Manchester Park. It's a particularly difficult one in terms of noise, with the highway along the eastern perimeter and the Blacktown Airport not three kilometres away to the north. Of course, those nearest the highway will be the worst hit, with heavy traffic noise as well as the noise from the light planes overhead. As you all know, the normal noise threshold for private housing is 55 decibels. At this site, the levels have been recorded as high as 67 decibels. Before the talk continues, you have some time to look at questions 36 
to 40. Now, as the talk continues, answer questions 36 to 40. The construction of the houses has to be somewhat modified from houses in most areas. In the houses on the highway and in the noisiest areas of this site, there will be a need for specialised double glazing and special acoustic seals will have to be fitted to the doors. All exterior doors in this especially noisy pocket will have to be solid core wood doors with hinges. Every house built on this site, not just those adjacent to the highway or nearest to the airport, will require high density insulation materials in the roof. Not only will all the roofs need insulating, the exterior walls will be required to be double brick. All ceilings will require double thickness plasterboard to be used in the construction. In the noisiest areas, Mechanical ventilation will have to be installed in the exterior walls. In those areas with sealed windows, it will be necessary to fit fans with absorbers to cut out the noise in those particular houses. Air conditioning units could also be fitted in the ceilings of such houses, but this is substantially more expensive than fans and may not be needed on this site. Coming back now to the double glazing I mentioned before, uh, Specialised double glazing requires a larger air gap between the inner and outer glass than normal double glazing. The gap must be at least 7 centimetres. The thickness of the glass is also a factor, 8 millimetres on the outside and 6 on the inside pane. It's essential that the glass be thicker on the outside than on the inside and that the gap between the panes of glass be a minimum of seven centimetres. Obviously, the noise factor will have to be taken into consideration with the layout of the houses. Living areas will have to be designed at the back of the houses, away from the highway. Bedrooms and living rooms will have to be built towards the back. And for those houses closest to the highway, two layers of plasterboard will be needed for the interior bedroom walls. Those rooms constructed at the front of the houses should be garages, laundries, kitchens, bathrooms and dining rooms. I have come to the conclusion that this development should go ahead, but with various acoustic modifications according to the position of the block in relation to the highway and intersection. That is the end of section four. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the...